You're here to study Bridgman. This is Recording 7 on Wedging, Lighting, and Head Structure from our 12-session summer boot camp. Updates are always at martialart.com. We're going to cover a lot today, attempting to define wedging, passing, and locking, light and shade. Two big issues about light and shade. One is rendering. Single source lighting tends to divide planes into two categories, light and shade. That's how we learn the logic of light, with simple, single, plane dividing light. The second issue about light and shade is that it creates a graphic pattern apart from whether it looks real or not. Artists can design that pattern apart from the rendering. Bridgman reminds us to look for patterns of on-off, on-off that create what he calls rhythm in a drawing, and we'll spend a little time on neck and head structure. Let's look at Session 7 projects. One was quick, flash poses, one second pose, one minute drawing. You'll be forced to see it. Model rush to the stand. One second. One minute to do it. Don't think too much. Feel. I recommended that you do a number of those. The opposite kind of thing where you have to think was torso wedges on redrawings or overlays of your favorite boxed torsos. According to your ability, with some of you, all you can do is get a string from form to form. Link the masses with a string, a strip of tape, or a wedged form. Now, the first person we'll look at here is Sharya. Here's what you did that serves you well. You thought of the rib cage apparently as something 3D. This line, let me make a thicker line here. Uh, this line and this line tells me, tell me that I'm looking up at that. And this bucket that looks almost as if you used a template. Did you use a, a, a template for this? I want to make a suggestion if you did. I would not use a template for this exercise. I think it does you better to say that even if I don't get that ellipse correct, it's close enough to know that I'm looking down on it and that it's facing this way forward and that that goes down there like that and that the cross axis would be like that and that means my front corner of the pelvis might be there and my front corner of the pelvis might be there and that Symphysis pubis would be there and it looks like a little sad Pokemon character, but that will be enough because we are not doing machinery and gears. Now, the argument for doing machinery and gears, I'm going to make it today in about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. We're going to start the value of knowing all of those specific points, but then we're going to disassemble that argument. There's going to be a time for this and a time for the other thing. First thing is stay away from this. Stay away from the, the perfect little buckets with, a, uh, with a, an ellipse template. There's one other thing I want to warn you away from. It can be useful, but its usefulness is about 2, 3, 4% compared to what we want to get at. And that is that if this is the this is the arrowhead on the back. I'm seeing an up plane there. I'm going to do the part that faces toward me all green and then give it a little sliver of that up plane to show that I'm looking down at that arrowhead like this. Front plane or back plane and a, a top plane. And then the muscles that go up into the spine to get every strand on there or even most of the strands, it's distracting. 
Uh, it distracts from the more important things. One person just said the gesture, but also uh, the volume. Now, let me tell you what the value is. When you know that the strands go this way, then you know that it's got to be pulling that way. And if it pulls that way, if something that has strands that goes like that pulls them together toward the center, it will change shape in the center and get thicker. And the folds, the folds of the belly, look how you've got that fold there and that fold there, and there would be another fold there. The folds of the belly always, or excuse me, the folds of any muscle, if you know that the strands go in a certain direction, like this, the folds will go counter to that direction because when it pulls, it will squash up in there. That is useful to know about the strands. Also, on the external obliques, many an artist has used hatch lines that follow those strands, so there is a little value in it. But what we want to get at here is that the more important thing is that this group of strong cords of the back, as they are sometimes called, this group, if we're looking down on that group, will have cross contours that go like a couple of tubes. And then at some point they'll spread out, but that groove, that groove will go all the way up to there. And we will have lines that give us thickness. That is the important thing about putting muscles on there. Even here on this external oblique, I'm going to be done with what I have to say in a minute about these. If this part of the external oblique is closer and that part's further away, do you see how a cross contour like that will make those ripples? Look how those ripples got thick. And if this portion of the external oblique is closer, do you see how that will start to thicken it? And if our eye is up here, it means that another cross contour will go around like that. And that little plateau and that belly that goes out there like that, that is the more important approach to doing muscle analysis is to wrap lines around it. I should have done this so that you don't have to see a line. Look how somewhere in there, because we've got a belly that faces to our right, this line will go like that. And because it's going to be a little flat behind there, and because we've got a another thing, an external oblique that will also be egg-shaped, we'll do that. And then over on the other side, we'll have another external oblique and watch how there's less of it to be seen because we don't see that side over on the other side. So this thing that goes like that, that will teach you how to light from imagination, among other things. Okay. Here, Olivia says, I struggle a lot with the obliques and I'm not sure I was doing it right because they look off to me. I was wondering if, they, I, I, if you could see any way I could improve them. Uh, they're doing the job, Olivia. Here's where I see that they're doing the job. When I look at this one and I can say, we see something, it doesn't look like an oblique, but it does look like it's connected to the side of a box. That's a start. And then it disappears back around to the side that we can't see on this box. Whereas here we see something on the lower part there because we see this side of the pelvis, but then it tucks around to the other side and we don't see it on the other side. Okay. And then when I look over here, I see something similar. Uh, and there's another thing that you're doing correctly. If you're saying oh, it's not that sophisticated, it's actually sophisticated for space. Here's another thing. This corner of the rib cage that this box represents and this corner of the pelvis are stretched this far apart from each other. Look over here and look at how they're compressed that tightly together. So now we've got a fundamental thing about torsos that will make them human. You say it doesn't look like a human body yet. No, it doesn't. I can tell that this is a back of a pelvis 
and I can tell that you're swinging this around here. I'd like to though see on, oh, I do, I do see. You're giving me that part there and then that part there. That gets you thinking, this is twisted this way, this is twisted that way. Remember, when everything's lined up, straight and balanced, it doesn't look dynamic. So this twist is a start. Now, here's the next point. These are slow motion. These are analytical. These take time. They take thought. They are hardly based on feeling. Last week when I showed you what Phoenix did from those boxes and then turned them into those gestural drawings, that I felt was so impressive that we've got two opposite roles that this person plays. And those are the two opposite roles that most great artists have found the balance between those. One is the analytical. The other is the sensorial or, or emotional or impulsive. The part that's not analytical. The part that acts like a kid. This is grown-up work. Letting go is kid work, and part of your assignment is going to be to do the kid work. You'll be amazed, surprised, and I hoped delighted by what part of your project is tonight. Jonathan, I'm putting yours in here too. I found that drawing from videos, not still frames, was great for flash drawing. Drawing from photos still created a stiffness and fear of being incorrect. Yeah, if you've got nothing to compare it to, drawing from live animals at the zoo drives animal drawing students crazy. And yet, drawing from live animals at the zoo is one of the things that puts an artist to the test of whether they can draw. Do they just get a photograph of the animal and copy it? Or do they watch the animal and say, hey, I like that moment right there that flashed into my memory. It, it stuck with that looked quintessentially lion. And everybody's had this happen where you get a flash view of something and it sticks in your brain. This is to exercise that part that watches something, even in motion, and says, now let me go work it out and do the hard part of getting it out, not as a copy, but as an invention. During a study, the image and forms are very clear to me. Well, that's, that's nice. So I'm just drawing on top of what I already see. Well, that's, that's enviable. The finished study, however, tends to be messy to unrecognizable. Is that a bad thing if my aim is not to create art but to study? Not necessarily. What am I losing or missing in the learning progress by skipping the cleanup stage? What you're losing or missing may be unimportant. If you don't need, Jonathan, to do this stuff because you can see it, well, uh, you, if you got it, you got it. And if you can see the looking up and the looking down, yeah, uh, that's great. I don't know that you're missing anything. Until, until you say, you know, I lost the structure on that. Because there are even great artists. Michelangelo is an example of it. Durer is an example of it where they had problems solving the position of something and they would go over to a side and figure out what position is that in by drawing a box. Okay, let's look at a question. Do you mind repeating what you said about the direction of the strands and how the fold will be? I didn't quite understand what you meant by that. Is that fold, what happens? Yes. When, watch this, look over here. These fibers are going this way, Anna. And when they go that way, we also got fibers over here pulling, but you see that when they, when these fibers pull, the folds are going to be at right angles to the fibers.
It's the same way that when this body goes this way, we've got a concave in there, but look, the line of the body is bending that way, so that means you're going to get the extra flesh compressed under there. And over on the other side, you're going to get a stretch that can even go concave around bone forms. All right, look at those lines up there, everyone. If you say, gosh, my stuff is so careful. Is this useful? Careful lines are useful. They teach form. But will they ever move beyond there? There's two ways that they move beyond carefulness to the expressivity that you see here. One is that you just keep doing the careful stuff and eventually it gets easy and you loosen up. It's a natural way. But in training, if you want to speed that up, you separate the two disciplines. We will do that in your homework. All right, let's move on to these terms. Wedging, passing, and locking. What do they mean? Dear students, he uses the terms, these terms and terms like them all through this book, not always consistently enough for me to figure out, but they are variously called. Let me tell you some of the, the terms that I went through this week. Wedge, mortise, lock, interlock, pass, pass into, pass over, pass around, interconnect, enter into, assemble, insert, fold into, and spread out of. There you have it, the entire Bridgman canon of words. I'm going to do the best I can in the next 15 minutes, maybe 20, to explain. Wedging. What does wedging mean? Well, wedging might mean if this portion of this forearm is made out of clay, and this portion of this upper arm is made out of a block of wood, you jam the block of wood into this clay and it will cut into there. It will wedge. Wedge is a block that is tapered. A wedge is a knife. It can enter other things. Now, let me tell you what's going on here. That forearm is thought of as a form and there's no question which end is closer, and the upper arm is thought of as a form, and there's no question which end is closer. So there are two different forms. On both of them, the long axis goes the same way. But on the next dimension, the shorter axis across, the next short axis across goes horizontal, and on this one, the next short axis goes standing up. And then, of course, the shortest axis, which I'll make blue, will be this way and this way. Now, I'm coloring them not according to the way they'd actually be as an XYZ. I'm coloring them to show blue is short. This short goes horizontal. This short goes tall. Red is the second longest dimension, and it's going horizontal here and vertical here, and they both have their longitudinal axis green. Now, why do that? Because when we jam this one, oh, let's even make it more of a wedge thing. Let's make it so that it's got a edge that could go into this part here. And as it goes into there, it's going to cut into there and make a shape where the perspective will be complex. Let's take this a little slower and make the point again one line at a time with comment. We'll start with the foreground box.
and for wisdom's sake and understanding's sake, always drawing through to the other side. Then we'll take this box, which stands taller, and we'll try to center it for convenience's sake. It may not be centered. And run all of its lines back the same direction. And as we see it touch, we could take it down lower, just make it land there, and that way we know to run that line up. And we, at least we've gotten started. It's not wedged yet. It's only touching. And if I run a center line and decide how far to bring on that depth line, bring this down, I can say right about here will make this land. So we can connect that line and connect that line. And then instead of taking it straight back, I can take it straight back and then bring it out about that far. And I'd need to do the same thing on the other side if I wanted it to be symmetrical. And here's where we get an interesting phenomenon. Let's change to red so that we can see this. This plane will be less foreshortened. This plane over here Remember, we're going out from that to that. This plane over here will be very foreshortened. But that looks right. Now, when we pull this out, we've got to say, where does it go from now? It could cut back in. It could belly out over here. It looks like what he's showing is that it actually gets very thick there because it's probably an upper arm. And so we could say that it keeps going back there and that echoes that arm. It might cut in there. There's a muscle, a separate muscle underneath there. The cross contours will now take it from here. But I want you to see one other thing about this box. Look how I'm making boxes that are symmetrical. If that's an X line, this one peaks over here, and this one peaks over there. What he's saying is that this is not symmetrical. It might be something like that, and we don't run along and find the other peak over there. The other peak, which may be coming from around there, might come there, and then. So that did not line up straight across. But again, this has to do with whatever it is that one is drawing. This has nothing to do with proportion as such. It's just the fact that forms fitting together takes a certain kind of thinking. It's logical, and it's involved, and it's part of an artist's training to various degrees. We don't need to be engineers to imagine forms vividly, but it helps. And some of it is necessary to imagine forms at all. Bridgman taught it and used it, and you may too. And then the shading is just saying that anything that is beyond that contour will all go dark and the same thing will happen to some degree on everything that's over there in that direction. Okay. That is wedging. How is it different from passing? Let's take a look at how Bridgman and other teachers at the Art Students League used the term in the early 20th century. Nicolaides, Section 19, Analysis Through Design. When you look at a diagram of a completely static or theoretical figure, you can see that the body is bilaterally symmetrical, having identical lines on the two sides. However, as an actual figure moves, no longer does it line up. And Nicolaides, in that section of the book, this is Bridgman, but this is Nicolaides. We've read that before. 
In the moving figure, identical curves do not appear exactly opposite each other. Hmm. If they did, that part of the form would complete itself like a circle. Okay, I don't really see that there's anything wrong with circle and egg forms at all. Artists use them a lot. But he says that completing itself like a circle as an abstract design destroys the continuity of the whole figure. Really, that's a harsh word, Kimon. And it prevents the eye from following the movement throughout it. All right, well, if you feel that strongly. These contours or forms, these moving contours and forms, these dynamic ones, these ones that don't destroy Kahneman do any, the kind that he's saying you want to get, have an interlocking movement before the impulse of one has a chance to die out. In fact, at some point where it reaches its crescendo of power, it is picked up by another and carried forward. Each impulse carries the momentum. Now, he's what's he talking about? He's talking about the viewer's eye. This is about the design of the picture. This is about the lines we put down. This is about all of those beautiful figures that we've seen him draw, where he does this and this and this and all of that rhythm that he is throwing those lines in there to make them not stop. We see the model through the gesture. When you think of design, think that the thing has been planned for a certain kind of movement. Okay, but gosh, this is hard. Gosh, this is hard to see that as that and that as that. And look how this one over here, it doesn't close the circle because it's got something down here that picks it up, and then it goes into there, and then that goes into there, and that goes into there. Is he thinking that way? He certainly is, and so were his fellow teachers. Artists have been thinking that way for a long time. How will I ever learn it? Look what he says. After a while, thinking that the thing has been planned for a certain kind of movement, after a while, the artist does this so instinctively that they think they are being perfectly natural. It becomes, after a while, the artist's way of seeing things. Wouldn't that be nice to, at some point when looking at a figure in motion, to be able to see this and to know that in drawing it, it might be a good idea to get a sweep in there. Oh, look how that foot goes down. And look how this shoulder goes up here. And then it goes down and then it dares to do something, it breaks. It makes a change of angle, but it still goes around there and then even kind of curls back up in there. We have got these lines of rhythm that are a part of how an artist sees. And if you think, well, what about anatomy? And what about form? The difficulty with this is that anatomy and form are not the same as seeing these rhythms. Therefore, to do Kimo Nicolaides analysis through, through the design where you did, I gave you the, uh, the uh, uh, exercise, uh, I think it was last week, the straight and curved lines for rhythm. Do this until it becomes instinctive. Okay, that was wedging and then we did passing. Now sometimes he refers to locking, that this is locking, but remember, these things could be done, I'll pause in a moment, these things could be done as chain links, right? That are going to be going around each other, through and around each other, where you'd have one part that goes away from you one way and another part that goes away from you another way and they're going to be changing direction. These could be helixes instead of simply flat patterns. But that is rhythm, 
and it's passing the eye along from one to another or interlocks. Okay, let's move on to locking. Are you ready? This is going to take brain power. It ain't over. We're going to put some energy into this next part. That, whatever it is, I don't know. Is that a rib cage? Is that a pelvis? No, not necessarily. It's actually two boxes. But we do see something. This box is less thick on this axis than this box. The axis that goes away up there, if we're looking down on both of those boxes, if this is the top and this is the top, this one is deeper. All right. What else should we do with these boxes? I'm going to put them together. I'm going to figure that if I could cut a section out of this box that would be the same distance back as that one, that I might be able to put them together. But I want to make it more complex than this. Now, I've tried to make something that interlocks, something like a magnet that's going to grip around here. And so far, it's easy because I only have three line systems. There's only a system that goes off to the left, a system that goes off to the right and up, and a system that goes down away. Notice I said goes. It goes away from me to the left, away from me up to the right, and away from me down to the right. And we name those X, Y, and Z. That's why this is easy. There's no line up there except for the area, the little X's that I put through there. No line up there that doesn't do that. And hey, watch this. Do you see how this whole wall here is enough of a wall to where I could do graffiti on it? Now watch, watch. I'm going to destroy that illusion with one line, erase one line, and put one in. Look at how all of a sudden it's no, you cannot do graffiti on air, or at least not easily. Hey! From two solid boxes to a box where I've scribed where I'm going to cut the concrete. Then I cut the concrete, but we're still in three line systems. No line up there worth paying attention to, including the ones over on the other side goes anywhere but those three ways. Now watch what happens next. This is a toughie. I've got to draw all the way through there to pull this off. That means up here you cannot see. Look at this thickness. That thickness carries all the way over to where it will touch this point. We'll touch somewhere on the other side. Where? On the side that that line and that line would meet. And then it would go up to there. Oh, how about we're going to do it on the other side? It's really hard to do this, folks. Even though there's not a single line that doesn't go left, right, up, down. Watch very closely. If I take this corner over here and I run it on that line system, where do I stop? Don't know yet. Where do I stop? Don't know yet. Oh, how would I know? I'd run this one back and I'd say it's got to be right in there. And the actual corner would come straight down and this part, internal area there of the tunnel would have to line up with some lines over there. Now watch, watch. I'll, I'll erase that. That can take five or ten minutes of thinking it through. If you're new to it, it's hard. Why? Because there's so many lines in there and they start to get confusing. And when you're doing it freehand, which is, I think, the way to do it, you can do this with, with rulers too if you're really having a hard time with angles. But now, 
I have enough information to take it to another level. I'm going to carve into it more. Are you ready? Because here we go. This is a big deal. The next step is not the thing you do when you're starting out. It's the thing that after you've done this 10, 15, 20 times, you say, could I carve into it and find some points to chisel out? There we are. If you look, what I did was I found a point here and a point here and went like that. And I found a point in the center here and I ran it back to where I wanted it to be. I'm going to erase that and then I'm going to go back to what we need to see. I ended up with that. That's all based. That form, even the bringing in of that center from what used to be the edges, bringing it in on X and bringing it back on Z. All of that was based on those three line systems, but it created vectors. We went from there to there. Let's do this again more accurately, where I did establish a grid in Photoshop, not only to make it more accurate, but to have more control in distinguishing scaffolding from form with bold and thin lines and faded lines. What next? Wouldn't it be nice if we could get this and this to get along? Wouldn't this world be a beautiful place if they were to just do the thing that, oh, shocking, they did it. They coupled. They interlocked. Let's do this again with the accuracy helping grid. If you want to study that, it should be fairly self-explanatory, granted that you've spent any time trying this very analytical approach to drawing. If you don't know Scott Robertson's book and his teaching, look him up. He has the best demos of this kind, of every line accountable to every dot accountable to three-dimensional laws that I know. And that will keep you busy. Look at his work and you'll see what I mean. Starting today, we are really going to split this kind of thinking and the other kind of thinking. And we're going to do it with a particular exercise. What is the difference between wedging and locking? I can't tell that there's a difference between wedging and locking. Can you? If your days are filled with going through Bridgman's Complete Guide to Drawing from Life and reading all the terms, and the other books too, and you can make a little matrix of where he uses these terms to apply them, and you can help me define them better than this, I will thank you. But if you're saying, what is the difference between wedging and locking? They seem pretty much the same thing, except that these look like these, oh, maybe this is the difference between wedging and locking. Let's do it over here. Let's say that if we were to pull a plane out of there that goes like this, sorry for the clunky lines, pull a plane out of there that goes like this, and it goes back around to the other side, and then maybe even goes around to the other side further like this, that it just, it can't get out that way, and it can't get out that way, and it can't get out that way, but it could still get out this way. No, we're going to really lock that thing down. We're going to make it so this thing is locked in for good. There it is. Now it's locked in. I don't know. Mark, if you think that the, the Bridgman one is tough, when you study animal anatomy and you study the muscles of the neck, you'll find that the different animal drawing textbooks will give you five names, five separate Latin names for the same neck muscle. I have learned something. It took me half a century to learn it. When terms don't line up, don't sweat it. People, language changes. 
And people make mistakes too. They'll say one word when they meant another and it never occurs to them. We had it happen in here. The important thing, the thing that makes us a good student is to at least get the ideas. Do you ever notice that some of the best artists are some of the least likely to know the terms? I sure have. Okay, if there's anyone else who wants to add, what was the case for machinery and gears? I'm making the case right now. The case for machinery and gears is that if you know how to do this precisely, it takes time and energy and a lot of artists avoid it. But I'm carrying, I'm on that right now. Let's continue going. Assembling the figure. This is assembling the figure. This is assembling the figure. Let's take a look. If we can say, I want a chest and I want a pelvis and I want to connect them and I know that it's got to be on the center because that's where that sternum goes. So I'm going to make a piece of string that goes from there to, the, where's it going to go? Right about there. And does the belly go out? Yeah, maybe the belly goes out. And if the belly goes out and you get a, sep, a center line on a thing that swells out like that, see, and because this is starting to go convex, you'll start to do that and this will spread out more. Now we start to get the ability to put something organic on there. Look how just that little bit of two separate forms clearly delineated up and down lines. Want to pull that out. We pull it out so that it's wider there. How do we do it on the other side? Make sure you go on that same line out there. Eyeball it. You don't need to measure it. That ought to do it. Oh, well, what if it goes back? Well, if it goes back, watch what happens. The other one's going to go back about the same distance. And then we're going to need to make more lines. We're going to need to do this kind of thing. It's going to make it more complex. Gosh, that takes a long time. Sure does. But look at the advantage of it. This logic of your 3D program to know that that leg is an American football. Sorry for you Europeans that I've been talking about footballs. It's that American football, United States American football. Sorry. that That's too far out. That isn't where it starts. But who knows? That pelvis might be wider on either side. We are taking these forms and putting them together. This is easy because every X line goes the same direction. The analogy is a wheel, a tire, let's say, a, a wheel on a car, and the tire treads, no matter how the wheel spins, the tire treads always go, sorry for the terrible ellipse, they always go in the same direction. Now, this line will change its direction because it's aimed back there. And this line is certainly changing its direction because it's aimed that way. And this line is aiming this way, pretty much the same direction that that one goes like that. And this one, we haven't had any lines like that on that wheel. All of these Y and Z lines will change the direction as they spin on the, what is that? That's the X axis. They spin on the wheel that is the way a tire on a car spins. Okay, that was what we studied last week about axes and movement on that sagittal plane. Then we say we've got a piece of tape now. And that piece of tape is thicker over there and it's thicker over here. It's not twisting. Okay, where do we go from there? Let's try again. Let's try again. Hey, that took some work. That took some. Making it round like that, you say, Marshall, that ellipse is not, that axis is not in the direction it's going. I am aware of it. And these are, are done to make a point. At least this, at least we know that one will be there and one will be there and the other will be over around on the other side and we've got to connect some dots that will curve 
convex as it goes away. And one will be there and one will be there and the other dot will be over on the other side and we're going to have to make a curve that even if that ellipse isn't correct, at least it gives us a bucket that we're looking down into and an egg that we're looking up at. That is slow motion. That is analytical. Where do we go from there? We got that piece of tape. We got that piece of string. Well, we could now thicken that with some cross contours. And we're going to have to do some figuring out on that external oblique. All we know is that it's, a, it's an egg shape. If my eye is right there, it's looking up and down in two different places. And you have, you have a book. Bridgman's book does not explain this. Bridgman's book exemplifies someone who already knows it. And that's why you're in this class. And that one in the middle is to show you, watch what we did. We went from this to this. And we did it with someone who doesn't draw like Bridgman. But if you have access to these, even if you don't have the teacher, and you say, I'd rather draw like that, then you've got it and you now understand what's going on here. With the interlocking components and the wedging. It's a literal wedge, isn't it? It's something that's shaped like this. It's something that's shaped not like a box, but like a wedge, and it's cutting down into there. This is why you spent that money on that book. We're going to deal with the, the strange wedging that goes on in there. That is a really interesting part, how one form fits into another. We're going to deal with that. Let me show you where. The hip joint. One week from today, and we're going to deal with, uh, it's really hard on the shoulder. But we are going to deal with it on the shoulder too, about how one part wedges, wedges in. But this one is an, uh, an inter interesting one. Okay. Now, I think I've made a point. I'm going to make it again and then we'll have questions. That one is worth working on. Pulling the parts apart, doing analysis. If you just, oh, look at this beautiful drawing. Now we're moving beyond analysis. And yet, in his, his uninhibited lines, look at his knowledge. In his choice to do it differently every time, look what he does with this. He decides to scoop it out like that. Well, gosh, he left out the abdomen. Hey. He chose to leave out the abdomen. Why? Why? Watch this, everybody. I think I'm going to guess why. I think it's because he liked that line. And he liked the way that line led up to some other lines and changed directions. I think that. Why? Because that's part of what artists do. They decide to favor an abstract design, especially in these simple and sketchy pieces like this. But if you want to go analytical and do the slow motion work, here's what you do. Take some pieces like that and try to draw these as separate forms. All right, let's do one more. That's a back view. We know because it, you could get your chest into this position. You could put your head here, like that, eyes there, and you could even bring your knees all the way up to there and crouch down. But if it's a natural view, good chance that the head is going to be here and it's going to be looking that way. And this is going to be a back with shoulders and the uh, arms are going to go 
out from there. Now, look what we did. We went from something very simple, a box in one orientation, a box in another orientation. They're all the same retreating X lines. And now we broke this box into two parts so that this line is not in the same direction as this line, and yet there's still the upper torso, the rib cage, and the abdomen, and then it changes all together. Well, we know something from what we've studied with Bridgman. We know that this is stretched out, which means if something in here represents a corner of a rib cage, watch, watch, we are very likely to do that. And we know that this part is scrunched up. And so if there are back muscles on there and butt muscles on there, they are going to squash up. That should be somewhere in that thinking, even though it isn't yet in this drawing. Oh, can we turn it into something more organic? Yes, we can. We can cut out of here something that might look a little more organic, and we can say, I want a wide point there, and we'll do what we did the other day, and then we'll say this is going to come down to that, and we're going to turn this into something more organic. Hey, what did we do over here? We started to find those two cords that are going away like this. This part is closer, that part's further away. Down here, what's going to happen? Whatever that triangle is like, watch what I do. Watch this next line. It's going to go like that. And it's going to tell us that this end is closer to us than that. And these two cords will probably squash in there and we'll get a meeting of lines that tells us that it changed direction and it squashed. Where do we go from there? Well, we can swivel it around into different positions and play with this in slow motion and assemble one part and another part. See, we might have thought of those as two separate parts, even put them on tracing paper overlays. See, I could draw that pelvis like that, and then I can draw that portion there for the upper leg, and I could you could, this week, draw an arm separately. Well, that's not very anatomical. It's a form. There's no question about its three-dimensionality. Now, what do we do? What do we do? Watch the screen. We stick them together, and they start to, we are assembling the figure. Okay, I'm done with that point. This is a way to analyze Bridgman. I'm going to pause because we're going to move on to the next subject in a moment. Light and shade separate into two categories in Bridgman's thinking and in basic training. It's not what you think. It's not light and shade. Yes, they do separate into the light planes and the dark planes, but there's another way they separate. They separate into the technical and the creative. Let's start with the technical. The technical goes like this. When light comes from above and you've got something that is not a flat disk, it's a ball. If the light comes from above and at a slight angle like this, sorry for those of you who say this is too beginning, I'm doing it. There's going to be a place where the light can't get beyond that point. That is the main light that Bridgman defaults to. It's the main light that many an artist defaults to because it is archetypal. It is the sun. And then look what happens. The sun has a little bit of reflected light that can bounce around from the ground or from a wall and fill in that shadow. There's also a reflected light from the moon. 
But you see, it's very basic even if there wasn't a sun and a moon and reflected light. This is the kind of light that best defines form. The Renaissance artists are the ones who figured this out so that it became scientific and we take it for granted. Now Bridgman's way of teaching you how to light a figure so that this, let's switch to blue here, this plane has light coming toward it. In that case, this is sort of a late afternoon or early morning light coming a little uh, from a little bit above. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say it's more coming coming in this direction. Why? Because not only do the planes that face that way get the light, but also the ones that are facing down as well as to the side are getting shade. That is elementary. How do we do this though? If we reduce a body to blocks, it's pretty easy. That one gets light, that doesn't. Watch, watch. That gets light and then abruptly, because a box, anything worth calling a box, has an abrupt change of plane, it means that it will have an abrupt inability for the light to get over to the other side. If it were round, if it were a cylinder, it would be a little different. Now that rubber band goes around there gradually, not abruptly, and so we'll get a little sliver of less light there, and then we'll get a greater sliver of less light there, and then the darkest part, and then we'll get a little reflected light, and now that shading tells us that it turns away from it gradually, it turns away from the light gradually. Now watch this, watch this, it doesn't just happen left to right. We can have something that goes in this direction, and if the light comes from above, we're going to have a point where it can't skim beyond this curve, and so we'll get a core shadow there and some reflected light underneath. So what does he do? He tells us this is an abrupt change, and then this is going to gradually come back to face the light. That is the simplest I can give you for how to light form. It has been taught for 600 years. Scott Robertson's book How to Draw teaches you all of that assembling stuff with lines. Scott Robertson's book How to Render teaches you this stuff, including in advanced ways. Dorian Eaton's courses on light on form and lighting and shading are the best that I know for beginners and for professionals too. Very inspiring, very clear. He makes it easy to understand. Now, look what Bridgman does. Can you think of the body as molding? People seem to have less trouble understanding architecture than they do understanding how to draw human bodies. That faces to our left. That's facing down. Now that's facing up. That's facing to the left. That's facing down. Up. Down. A person may have a very difficult time drawing a body, but if they can think of it as architecture. Metaphor is to play pretend. To think of a body as molding, the top of the head, the underside of the head, the chest facing up, a plane break, but it's not a break, it's a plane transition, it's gradual. So we make a gradual transition and then this part tucks in between these two blocks. Ah! The body as architecture. That's part of your homework tonight. That's part of your analytical homework tonight. Now I'm going to give one more lesson. 
in the next five minutes about light and shade and why there's so much to be learned from the way he has shaded this back and then made it go away from us. And then he's not shaded this buttock. And then he's shaded that gluteal fold, which is not anatomical in this at all. No, nobody's gluteal fold happens so rigidly across like that. It's much more organic. Bridgman is turning it into something architectural to clarify to a student, think this way. Now, here's what we never do as students. When we see something like this, if we have not learned perspective and form, we never look at that and think about this and this and this. And that if light were coming from above, it couldn't get beyond that part. Now watch, watch the next lines. Here's the big deal. If light were coming from above, it could never get beyond that part either, because now we're trying to create the illusion of 3D. This is just as much a coming toward us and going away from us as this is. Now, when the light is coming from above and it's going to light this plane, but it can't light this plane, a person who hasn't been trained never thinks of the fact that that will gradually change. A person who has not been trained in rendering and form will never think that if the light's coming from above, this is facing up and that is facing down. You might be able to think it right here, but all of that will fall into shadow. Now, I hope that was clear. If it isn't, here's what Bridgman does to make the point. He extrudes this thing. He gives us a facing toward light that's probably coming uh, something like that. It's facing down, but it's also coming from, so the planes that are here are getting it. And then the light can't get beyond that, so that goes into shade. But then this faces back up, but then that faces down. And he's carrying it into forms that are foreshortened. The logic is obvious here because that light would reach and that light wouldn't reach. The logic is not obvious when it's foreshortened. That is facing up. That is not. Therefore, that gets dark. Okay, I think I've made the point. Luca says the thing he does is draw the cast shadows that add to the drawing, but not all of them. Amen. Robert Beverly Hale mentions this. He ignores cast shadows 97% of the time. But does he ignore them entirely? He does not. Cast shadows because, as Robert Beverly Hale pointed out, all through art history, you look at Egyptian art, you don't find cast shadows. And in Renaissance art and in Baroque art, you find cast shadows. You find that so many cast shadows are missing. You don't find them. The artist has removed them. Why does an artist use cast shadows? There are a few reasons. For those of you who don't know, if the light's coming from above and at an angle, that's a form shadow. That's a core shadow. It's actually on the form. There's no light there in, in that part that can't get it. But then it throws it like a fisher person casts a net or casts a line. It casts a shadow onto another form. Why don't I use those? You do use them. 
but you leave them out most of the time. And when you do use them, you use them for the next concern, which is compositional effect. Oh, also, look how that cast shadow can crawl around and make that shoulder look round. Or it can crawl across and make that robot look flat. But this neck could cast a shadow that could create a form cross contour on there that could really make this chest look thick. Cast shadows exist for at least a couple reasons in art. One is to help define the form they fall on. It's instead of a rubber band, it's a dark strap wrapped around something to show what it's shaped like. It's a black belt wrapped around something, or a light gray belt wrapped around something, or a bright red belt. Cast shadows can be any color you want them to be. They can wrap around something, but there's another reason. I don't know whether this does anything for you. I just think there's something about that little accent of black in there that looks good. Is that what he's thinking? Is that what Bridgman is doing? Is he saying, I'm going to put these shadows in here because they look good? Yeah. That is what he's thinking. How do you know? He takes time in the book to do little charts like this. He's saying that shadow sides. If you think of your composition as calligraphy, as a bass line in music, that it echoes, it continues through there and holds together like a rhythm. It is purely aesthetic. No, 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 not purely, not purely, because this is a, an egg that the core shadow is over there. So it is telling you that that's facing down and this facing up. And then this abdomen is an egg where the light, which is coming from above, can't get over to that side. So it says that's facing down and this is facing up. And that the light, which is coming from above, can't get under there. It isn't purely compositional. But in these diagrams, he's showing you that's how we choose whether to let a shadow side not be in shadow. How come? How come this isn't casting a shadow all over the leg and casting a shadow down there? Because it doesn't make his drawing look the way he wants it to look. So, what's his point? Shadow shapes. Echo. Shadows create rhythm. Not a rhythm of outline shapes or angles. Not a rhythm of ch form chasing position because he's, he's already given us that. A rhythm of shadow shapes that echo. Whether to make them thicker or thinner or higher or lower contrast is a creative decision. We're almost done. There's a great deal of leeway in arranging shadows, so artists get to use that leeway to create visual rhymes and rhythms in their visual poetry. There are several plates in the book where it'll take you down from the top to the bottom of the figure. There's a side view where he shows something like, like that and like that 
and like that and like that. And the whole purpose of the side view is this business that he was teaching us up there about passing or locking. He's got a figure from behind that has so, such wonderful, wonderful uh, shape of shadow on the back like this and a shape of a buttock like that and a leg going away from us like that and a leg coming toward us like this and uh, a leg, a foot going out there like that and the other leg wrapping around there like that. And it's, it's just twisted so marvelously as an abstract. Seek them out with what you now know and rehearse them a couple ways. One is analytically as forms. We're moving on to the head next. Well, let's see, if the head is facing down like that, and the light's coming from above, how come that isn't dark? Because it's not, uh, that's not where the light's coming from. It's coming more from the side than above, a little bit down, a little bit down. So that this is just a little bit of shade, but the bulk, how come that sh core shadow is so strong there and then he loses it here? Because he chose to. How do you know whether to choose to? Go back to the thing we talked about, find your metaphors and your rhythms and the way things change in the natural phenomena you love. And that might inspire you. All right. Questions. Are shadow patterns similar to shadow rhythms? Pattern and rhythm are the same thing. There is no rhythm in a picture. What is the word rhythm when we talk about pictures, folks? It is a musical metaphor. Pattern is visual. Rhythm is what happens when you look through that pattern and you speed up at some parts and you slow down at other parts. So yes, shadow patterns are shadow rhythms and vice versa. Would it be helpful to think of shadows as a design first and then figure out? Yes, that's what some artists I really admire do. Start with an abstract and find the form in there. Okay, now I started uh, talking about this head that's thought of as a form. You could hardly find a better place to study light and shade than a human head in Bridgman terms. He teaches you, when he teaches you about the head, about light and shade. Have a conception of a solid body. A decided difference between the light and the shade. No near tones of equal size or intensity. Now, there will always be people who, when they read these, say, I disagree, I disagree. And they never get the value that he's getting at. Thinking in terms of only light and shade is the way to learn. Thinking in terms of only sea and dry land is the way to survive if you're a human animal. If you're a fish, you'd reverse it, but still, the water, the fully immersed water, and the dry enough land are important. We start here to learn rendering. Only light and dark, and then we gradually bring in others. And look why that's useful on the head. The head has a part that faces not only forward, but primarily forward, and a part that faces not only to the side, Parts of this, the front of the ear might face forward, but it's primarily to the side. That's how we simplify learning. Oh, but it's not that simple. We're going to have one part that cuts into, what are we going to do? That's where we'll spend a little time today. We're going to make the head complex 
only as you would want it to be complex to draw something other than a block. How does Bridgman teach the head? Are you ready? Bridgman is going to teach the head. We're going to get to the neck here too. He's going to teach the head the same way he taught the thorax and the pelvis. Ah, I don't like those things. He's going to teach you the head by telling you you got an up and down line, you got a going away one way line and a going away another line. Ah, I want something more exciting. There it is. That's going to be the job. Okay, let me make it a little bit more clear. Here's how he's going to teach you the head. Can you draw a wedge? That's not a block, but it might have come from a block. It might have been carved out of a pure right angled block. And we just said, I'm going to find a part right there on the bottom of that block, and I'm going to connect some lines. That's how you draw, that's how you learn to draw an accurate wedge is you, you build it out of a block. You don't just arbitrarily place this bottom part. But can you learn to do that? And how long will it take to do that? That could be 20 hours of your training to know how to find the center of that or put the center over here, or put it over here, put it over there and draw a wedge. Now, what else do we need to do? We're going to need to find something else. In this case, he gives us an overhanging thing. He says that I'm going to give you a thing that overhangs. What's that mean? That means that if that goes up like that, that's going to go out like that. And then it's going to, let's see if I can do this. He's actually got it more complex than what I'm going to do. He's going to say that's going to spread out there like that and go behind. And now we'd know at least where the planes were. The underplanes are going to be the dark part. I'd like to be able to lighten that up because I made a clunky line there. But you get the idea. That's how he's going to teach you to draw a head. If you're disappointed, you might want to switch your energy into, if I were 10 or 11 years old and somebody were to tell me that's how you draw a head, I'd say, I think I can do that. I think I can do that. It'll be harder than you expect. But look what he's done. Head structure. For a forehead is the wedge. The forehead is a wedge of a, a block that is not as wide. It is not as wide as the cheekbones. Hmm. So that means I'm going to need something that is wider than this line but it could be on the same axis as that line. It's just wider. And then it's going to come forward like this. And I'm going to have to get, I'm going to have to get this line placed right there so that it will land. It might even cut into there like that. And then try to make it symmetric uh, over on the other side. Something like that is going to help me assemble a head. Sorry, sorry for the terrible uh, proportions, but you get the logic. The logic is that this is wider. This is wedging into it. If you could see over to the other side of that form, it would be like that. The center line would go there and like this, and then this is going to go upward, and this is going to go downward, and if the light were coming from above, well, that would get a little shade, and this might get the tiniest bit of shade, but this would not get shade unless, hey, there's no nose on there. What if we were to put a thing that sticks out? that sticks out like that and has a side plane and then, oh, casts a shadow. Maybe, maybe that would help me to construct a head. This is one way to solve a problem. 
let's do it a different way, just to let you give you permission that you don't have to follow rules. That's a circle. Sort of. That's trying to be a circle. If we were looking at it from the side, we'd put an egg like that, and the proportions of a head are just the easiest thing in the world from the side, because you put a circle and an egg, you'll learn something about a neck. But what happens when this character who we're looking at from the side turns toward us? Watch this, a line on a ball, a perspective line. And then as, as Andrew Loomis will do, don't let it tuck under because look how this part is all out there. See, it's not going underneath, it's coming out there. Drop that center line down to there and then finish that egg. Wow, it worked! It's starting to look thick and we're looking down slightly. So when we say, if I'm looking slightly down, that I want a curve like this, everything will be affected by that curve. But we'll need to carve back into some eye sockets. When I carved back into them, I was going back on a line like that. See, I'm setting them back a bit. And then I want to pull out on the Z line. All of this, every decision to build on a ball, is based on a box. If I'm going to carve into there, I'm going back on that line. Back on that depth line. And if I'm going to pull out of there, watch this next line. This is what this is important. I'm going to pull out on this line system and then cast a shadow under there. Look how that little line makes it look 3D. So, when I'm building something like a nose, I'm going to pull it out this way and maybe use a little cast shadow to accentuate it. And if this character is frowning, watch this line. If this character is frowning, this character is frowning around a line system that goes up at the left and maybe slightly up at the right, which means the, the frown will pull with a curve like that that almost feels like a smile. And if we light with that egg light, we can get a little core shadow in there. And the other stuff, you've probably been doing it since you were a kid. Light this, put little pockets of shadow where you see little pockets of shadow. There's a pocket of shadow in the air. Oh, I, I'm glad I made this guy bald. But what if I didn't? What if I wanted to give this person a nice, healthy head of hair that so many of us dream about? Well, we would probably find some planes that wouldn't face up on that. What I'm showing you is that there's more than one way to draw a head including primitively. When you were a child and you drew the mommy or the daddy whom you loved or feared, you drew this way and it was wonderful. That's one of the best drawings I've ever done. It's a whole different way. But if you say, I'm going to draw realistically, if I'm going to draw realistically, there are also different ways to use the box, to use the ball, to look up at that head and pull a nose out, to put a dot there and a dot there and know that the eyeballs will be behind deeper into that dot, to find that chin somewhere on there and maybe run a kind of a horseshoe underneath there and run that up to find where that ear would be on that box and pull a few lines down like that and know that that might be all there. There is more than one way 
to draw. But this is one of the most useful sets of drawings that I know in any head drawing books for teaching us. Watch over here, I'm going to draw over here, that that is facing to the right or to our left. This is facing forward and up. This is facing to our left. That is facing forward and up. Now watch the next line. The next line is tough. It's not going to go out there. And it's also not going to go down there. It can't. It's got to go over on the other side, back to there, and it's going to some point connect with that one. And if we were to run a line this way, then we'd run it down, but we'd also maybe have it do this to be able to get the form of that eye. And then watch, this is going to run across there and then it's going to change directions and go straight down. We don't even have a mouth on there yet, but we've got planes. Okay, I'm going to pause. I'm teaching you about head structure. As Bridgman sort of explains it. Anna Vargas says, so it seems that Loomis method is subtracting, carving into a box, while the Bridgman technique is more additive, adding forms on top of a box. Would you say, yeah, but Bridgman is less consistent. Bridgman doesn't show you one way. He shows you all sorts of ways. Uh, and that can be confusing. Does it want, look, even here, look what he's done. This gives us a wedge that's jammed into there. This doesn't. He's turned it into something more like a pure block. How do I know which one's right? The inconsistency. Well, that could give me permission to do it however I want to do it to solve my problems. On page 72, He's got the mouth aiming up at one point, and the other one he's got the mouth muzzle aiming down. Great example. What do they have in common? They both turn it into this. They both turn it into a cylinder. Make a guy with a nice nose there. Get an upper lip like that, like a cartoon character. Okay, what did we do? We built the muzzle on a form like that. Could we have done it otherwise? Watch. Let's do it otherwise. He also shows us in that analysis that the line goes around there like that. And we can put a nose on there. Like so. And the muzzle was built around something we were looking down on there. The point is, on page 72, all three of those drawings up at the top are at least building it out of forms, and he's choosing different kinds of forms to get different effects. Well, these all look pretty mechanical. Isn't this an awesome head? Isn't that a Bridgman head? Now, he's not thinking of a cylinder here, is he? I think he's thinking of something like this. And he's got muscles pulling down on the corners of that mouth to where you get squash under there. 
And then he's got that line being tugged down to there. And then he, watch the center line, watch the center line. Do you see how it goes out there like that and we get a little shade that way? And he's even got some bundling up down here to show muscles are pulling this way. And he doesn't even include the upper lip, but he does give a little bit of that filter. Watch, we could, we could do this. And now it starts to look more lip-like, tend to get more of a shadow around there. There's a lot in Bridgman about the, the head and the features. But in our class today, what do we have time for? We have, it's an introduction to the neck and head structure. We have certainly been talking not about head anatomy, but about head structure. What's it structured out of? Can you draw one of these? And can you draw one of these? And then can you make sure that this is a little longer? It's not doing that here. This is a little longer. Than that one. And then can you find out how to put them together and try to connect those lines? That is slow motion analytical work. And he's doing it yet another way over here. A plane that goes up, what would it look like over on the other side? It would be like that. And we wouldn't be able to see this blue part because it would be foreshortened away from us and over on the other side. But that's the slow motion analytical work. And now he's not using the two by four, he's using a wedge. Oh, he changes his mind all the time, but what fun it should be. Look how aware he is of the, of the skull underneath there. Look how this plane over here, which is going away from us radically, that same plane over here is not going away from us so radically. Look how, watch this, this whole angle of the jaw is going back around to the other side. This was the solution. All right. How do we study? We study the skull. Bridgman's skulls are not the ones to study from. His organic skulls, I mean. Because that's really hard to understand. But Gottfried Bamas has skulls that have been turned into architecture. But uh, Bridgman has skulls that are turned into what I think are great architecture. Now he's changed it all together. Now he's decided that a block of butter. There it is. Block of butter for the cheeks. Oh, where's the nose on that? We'll find it. We'll put a dot somewhere on a center line. We'll pull out of there. And if we're looking up at that nose, we'll put it in there. And then we'll find a place in the center over here and we'll run a plane like that. And then what about the side of the nose? There it is. Probably lit the same way as this. And what about the other side? You can't see it. Same way you can't see the other side of the block of butter. What about the neck? How's he thinking of the neck? Oh gosh. Hate to tell you this. The neck is a cylinder. And it's going away from us. What's he doing over here? The neck is a cylinder going away from us down here. And then the neck becomes a cylinder going away from us the other way up here. Really? That's the neck? Yeah, that's the neck. Does it get more complicated than that? It sure does. But that's where we're starting. Is there anything I should know about that? Oh, this time it's not a cylinder. This time it's just a smaller version of the head. There it is. That's it. But I, I kind of wanted to draw more than that. Hey, let's take a look. One thing we see is from the side. If that's a rib cage or something like it, and that's a pelvis or something like it, 
and that's a leg or something like it. And this is an arm going back, and the head is going to be, let's see, one head width for that sternum, and then about a head width up. We studied that in our second session. About a head width up, we're going to have a ball in here. How do I know where to place the ball? How about if we did this? We find a rhythm line that goes like that and then goes up there like that. Ah, that would help us to place a ball and get it proportionally making some sense. The neck aims forward. It's not a cylinder that goes straight up and down like a pipe. It aims as it goes up forward. That's a start. And it also means that if we're thinking of this rib cage and that opening of the rib cage, that we would go like this and we would see over there on the back, got a chest here. We'd see over there on the back how that line comes up there like so and is aiming forward. We're going to do some anatomy in about three minutes. There's going to be a pit of the neck there and a muscle that goes around to the ear and a pit of the neck there and a muscle that goes around to the ear and then a trapezius and some other things that will go on there. Let's look at them. Bridgman is aware that the spine is going like this and then, oh, actually it's not facing so much forward there because he's pulling his head back, but notice that it wanted to go forward before he pulled it back. One good way to find the position of the neck is to run the line of the spine because the neck is part of the spine. Run it from that convex back up and forward and then maybe tip it back. What has he done? He's made a little triangle in there. What is that? That's a muscle. That's a muscle that people think of as a back muscle. It's actually an arm muscle and a neck muscle. It's a shoulder blade muscle. It does a whole bunch of things because it's got a lot of fibers. We'll get to it in about five minutes. Let's start with the other set. We've got from behind the ear, a bump on the skull called the mastoid process. We've got at the chest a pit of the neck, a sternum, and we also have a clavicle, a collarbone. There's that collarbone in there. There is a muscle that begins on the sternum and on the clavicle that goes to the back of the head, and it's called the sternocleidomastoid. And here we're seeing that it's like another muscle we studied last week. What muscle did we study that last week that it's like? External oblique. External oblique went from that front part of the pelvis over to the side and back of the rib cage. And because it's oblique, when it pulls, it will help spin the head like a piece of tape pulling a spool. Now there's a throat group in there and a hyoid bone with some muscles that come down and connect to that. So you'll get a plane break in there. A great way to think of that part underneath the chin is, is like a funnel because a funnel is three-dimensional. And so that one part will face towards you, one part will face this way, one part will face that way, one part seeing it as three-dimensional will help you to light that. The throat group is the part that echoes the spine aiming forward. It's a plane break and changes. Bridgman has quite a bit in there on it. I'll show you one of them. But let's swivel this around to the front. 
Because remember, if we were looking at this from the front, we've got the sternum in the front. We've got the mastoid process behind the ear. So that is actually further away from us, and this is closer to us. Let's take a look at it from the front. This is closer to us. That is going away. So there's a great big form there. Two parts to it. A flat part like a piece of tape and a thicker part. Look how subtle it can be. And yet, this line, this line from the front will always overlap that line behind it, which is more complex than you might think. It's two muscles, levator of the scapula and trapezius coming over there. Now, that is anatomical. Sharya, if you were to go in there and copy every strand, it wouldn't help you that much. What would help you? You got a Bridgman drawing in there that shows you that if you're thinking of this as something you're looking down on, and the pit of the neck where the sternum is, is there, and we've got something wrapping around to the other side, this is a drawing worth understanding and then looking at human necks and seeing them as strong cords. And then that throat group, now it's not like a funnel. It's more like the underside of a staircase. What do you do with this? Well, you could do a number of things with it, but thinking of it as a funnel that we were looking up at, that could help you because then you'd know that if it's facing that way and then we've got a plane break like that, we can see this part over here foreshortened, this part over here less foreshortened. Bridgman has this stuff in there. I'm showing you that next get started. How do we, how do we start it, uh, with this? That that's a cylinder coming up out of there like that. Then what? It's got a pit of the neck, and it's got things that go back around behind the ear. And then another thing that's going to come out of there and go into the shoulders. We've only got about 10 minutes. Let's take a back view. This is, in the amount of time we've got, I want to give you something useful. There is a muscle that goes from the base of the head, the occipital bone, spreads out and goes into the shoulder blades, has a complex bunch of strapping tape there, and then connects typically down at the 12th rib. Look at the fibers on the trapezius are fibers you would want to know about because fibers pull along their long axes and you'll start to see that can affect the shoulder, that can rotate it the other way. All of these fibers show the direction of pull. But what I want you to see is that, look how he's got the spine now, instead of going up like that, he's accentuating this. What I want you to see is that from the front, the head is closer to us, and the sternal mastoid goes behind. Remember? It goes back behind that ear. From the back, the sternal mastoid came from over on the other side, went behind the ear there, and the trapezius is closer to us from the back, and it goes up and hooks into the back of the ball of the skull. Let me show you up close here. 
The structure of the neck is just three groups of muscles. A throat group, which is a funnel that goes back in there. A rotator group, which is the sternocleidomastoid that goes from the pit of the neck to behind the ear. And then a complex, it's actually a network of muscles in there. There's a scalenus and a splenius capitis. But don't worry too much. Here's what we care about. This muscle, which is shaped sort of like a kite, watch how Bridgman will teach you to do it. Let's go to the ball of the head thing. Now that's going to be the ball of the head. And we're behind it. And this head is positioned so that the face is facing over there. Ah. Eyes looking that way, nose looking that way. What about the rib cage? The rib cage is going to be down here. And it's in a different position. We would see more than this side, more of that side than the other side. So watch what we do. Then what does Bridgman do? He actually puts a dot. He puts a dot here to say that's the base of the trapezius. And where does the trapezius go? It goes up into the base of this cranium, the occipital bone. And he draws a string and changes direction and shows you more of this side of the trapezius that will go along those shoulders and less of the other side. And he's starting to squash this side and put extra bits in there. And he's stretching this side even to the point of where he's making it a concave. But then he scrunches up this shoulder. All right. Bridgman has in the book, if you are caring about the neck, many images to study, and now I hope that you will study them with more understanding that you have. If you already say, I already knew neck anatomy and I already knew a head anatomy, I am really sorry if I bored you. But what I hope you got out of this is that Bridgman changes his mind, messes around, with forms, with shapes, with angles. My last slide that I'll show you from Bridgman is that he planes the head and says the light's coming from this way and these won't get it. And then he says, no, nah, I changed my mind. I changed my mind. Let's make the light come from this way. What would it look like? Look at the screen. Yeah. That could be fun and creative. Uh, Anna is telling me that this was a bit confusing. It's because we covered a lot of material. And the answer uh, to the question, Anna, is that should we start by just focusing on making wedges from boxes first? Yes. If you just go back to, this is the grown-up stuff. I'll get there later. Let me start with the simple stuff, which is very hard. Seeing this box in here takes concentration. And I'm recommending, it's a boot camp. Let's go to our assignment, our project. Analyze poses as architecture. You say, I want to learn the head. I'm a portrait artist. I don't care about the other poses. All right, analyze heads. Choose four to 12 of your favorite. Minecraft them into block forms. Assemble the blocks with connecting forms or simplify them into moldings. If you're new to this, that could keep you busy for a week or three. But Anna, that's what I recommend for you. But if you say, I'd like to do more than just Minecraft them, 
okay, don't make them more complex necessarily. We're analyzing poses as architecture. You can make the block forms curved. Now light them if you like. You say, Marshall, it's too easy for me. Try reversing the light if you can. It can be more difficult than you think. It's not always just swapping out the light and dark planes. That is the slow motion work. That is the analytical part. That is where your drawings may not be pleasing, but it is so valuable for your understanding of how to invent. Say, all right, what do I do if I already know how to invent? Here's something you might not have thought of. This can help you with technique. I found a great way to practice line quality this week. It's going to sound terrible. You're going to say, Marshall is a bad influence. You're going to say, no, he didn't say it. But here it goes. Trace. Put tracing paper over some of your favorite Bridgman drawings. Find some of those ones that are so expressive. And get wild with a nine, with, with, with a bunch, maybe even 20 one minute impulse drawings as relief from form analysis. Use a drawing tool you enjoy. Pick up that drawing tool and say, yeah, like that and like that, and try to make it a continuous line if you can. If you don't want to trace, you can say, I want it to go wild, but gosh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull that back there. And this is not analytical. It's teaching you to get wild. Loosen up. Have fun. This is the going back to kindergarten part. Let's go back to the assignment. If you can make it a continuous line, it rehearses rhythm. When we slow down and try hard to solve problems, we gain understanding, but we go at speeds that hardly swing. Trace. Trace fast. Trace in a continuous line unless you feel like stopping and starting again. But treating it like a downhill race where it's safer to keep moving than to stop. We've been thinking a lot, I trust. You've been thinking a lot. You've been learning theory about big lumps of the body their orientations in space, their axes, their movements, their twists and compressions and extensions, all of that analytical stuff. If you've been studying the book, I hope you've been living in the book. But how do you get it into your drawings? Sometimes you get it into your drawings by just messing around over the top of it and the lessons come back. Ooh, look how he compressed that more than you'd think. Okay, see you tomorrow at the same time. That was session seven from our 2020 bootcamp. Updates and more stuff at martialart.com.